Doshin, your interview, the interview that we put out um, earlier in the summer called A Zen Master Talks About Jordan Peterson in the Shadow, has become one of the most viewed things on our channel, certainly the most viewed thing that doesn't actually have Jordan Peterson in it, and some really interesting, really polarized reactions. So I'd love to explore that with you now, kind of why it was so successful and also why people seem to either love it or hate it. You're a Zen master. So we are back once again with the Renegade Master. Back once again with the Renegade Master. Deep four damage of power to the people. I think of myself more as a troublemaker. Renegade works, though. We were just speaking before, and you said that it has already kind of affected your life in a way. Well, it, it has um, certainly increased the number of people subscribing to our YouTube channel. <laughs> exponentially I might add so that's interesting we've had to create a little more content the polarization that happened on the interview was very interesting to me and um, I'd like to talk about it a little because I think it's a it's informative there's so much that can be learned from polarization um, when I read the comments um, I noticed just at rough glance about 40% of them thought I, I, was, I sucked. And about 40% of them thought I walked on water. And about 20% of them thought I was just weird. So to me, I really pay attention to what Byron Katie says. It, it's congruent with my experience. She says, we don't talk to each other. We talk to each other's projections, but only 98% of the time. So what I saw was all of that that I was reading were projections. They were projections of shadows, some golden shadows and some ugly shadows. But for me personally, it was a gold mine. Because I know that even though they're shadows, and I shouldn't take it literally, every time somebody projects something on me, there's a hook inside me that that projection can hang on. So it was a gold mine in the sense that those, those, those comments were mirrors that enabled me to see some things about myself that were fascinating. So I want to thank you for that. Say more about what were those things? Well, I, I did notice that the, uh, one of the things that really upset some people, not all, everyone, and again, half the people it delighted, half the people it, it troubled them, was my laughter. And to me, that is just, it's a practice that we consciously do. We call it sacred laughter. I had a quick look back through the comments just before this interview mm -hmm. and one of the things that a lot of people seemed to talk about was they found parts of maybe the laugh we've already talked about but inauthentic mm -hmm. fake or inauthentic mm -hmm. what do you what do you make of that you know that that fascinated me um, um, if you talk to any of my students and you ask them what is the most important thing that they're here you know what they say and you can ask these two if you like it's my authenticity my integrity so that one really it really puzzled me I didn't see there there must be something in the way that I'm using emotions because I'm playing with emotions you know the we create emotions I mean, actors create emotions for an impact. And I know that that's something that I consciously do. I must not do it very well, is all I could think of. Because Ali, um, my colleague, was talking afterwards, and he was saying how perfect the reaction was because the art of, of Rinzai Zen is the trickster archetype. It's the renegade archetype. So the fact that it was so polarizing, the fact that people had such a mixed reaction to it, was in some sense a perfectly Zen reaction to the interview. And that is conscious. That is a conscious intention that I am deliberately doing. Um, the, the, the biggest thing I want to accomplish is I want you to be uncomfortable. 
because that's where you're going to grow. Safety is the most unsafe spiritual path you can take. It leaves you frozen in fear, unable to take risks, unable to learn and grow. And that is something I deliberately, intentionally do. You can ask anybody in the Sangha that as well. This is part of Integral Zen. You know, if, if you're not willing to be uncomfortable, you're in the wrong Sangha. Go find another one. And we tell you that right up front. Something came up when you were talking about the, the reading the comments. And it's quite exposing, like putting stuff out there and then yes. reading what people think of it. What I hear you saying about this is extremely valuable information. It's really valuable to have all of these people sort of reflecting back what they're seeing. Yes, it's valuable to reflect on that. And in, internally, look at where the hooks are. So uh, the laughter was one example. The collective shadows were another example. You know, I happen to think a whole lot of Jordan Peterson. I think he's an amazing guy. He's brilliant. And I was fascinated just because I was criticizing one little thing. People projected uh, a devil on me. That was fascinating. That's a collective shadow. That's if you don't agree with me, I'm going to attack you. And it's not a very high level collective shadow. It, it is so important in Integral Zen to let everything inform you. We let the body inform us. We let the nature inform us. We let dreams inform us. We let our emotions inform us. We let our thoughts inform us. We let our projections and other people's projections inform us. Why would you turn away a teacher? Everyone is my teacher. Why would I rob myself of these teachings? And this is something that I think a lot of people don't realize about spirituality or true spirituality, which is it's not supposed to be a palliative. It should make you question, like true spirituality is, is designed to make you uncomfortable. It's designed to make your ego uncomfortable to allow something else to emerge. Yes, yes. The, the ego wants to be safe. The ego wants to be comfortable. And it's not a bad thing. This is why we're here. We survived. <laughs> but it, it is antagonistic to developing insight and spiritual growth. And it's, it's antagonistic to seeing your shadows. Because shadow work, by definition, is uncomfortable. You're, you're, you're seeing the parts of yourself that you've repressed. You're dealing with the emotions that you've suppressed. And it is guaranteed to be uncomfortable. And true religious breakthroughs are the same way. The insights. So by definition, by training, I, it's my job to make people uncomfortable. Where does that become dangerous though? Because oh, I think a lot of people a great question. I think a lot of people are very suspicious of spirituality yes. because we've we've seen many spiritual yes. communities go bad. Yes. And while they're going bad, a lot of the spiritual teachers are saying, No, it's just people can't handle how crazy wise I am or how yes. how I'm I I don't follow your petty bourgeois rules. Like this this can be very difficult. How how do we know when things are getting out of control and people are getting hurt? This is so important. In Rinzai Zen, the, the Roshi, the Zen master, has absolute authority. Now, this is problematic if a Rinzai Zen master goes crazy. He's got absolute authority. He's got absolute power. And he's, he's the only one that's really, this is a serious problem. And you, you see this problem happening all over spiritual communities. You see it with my beloved Sogyo Rinpoche, the, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, fell out of favor with his students. My teacher's teacher, Edo Shimano, had a real problem with this. This is a real common thing where these Eastern teachers come to the West. It's like they don't have the antibodies for the Western viruses that cultural viruses that they're succumbed to. So what we've done in Integral Zen consciously, the board of directors can fire me if I get out of hand. We have uh, an integrity circle 
that can challenge me. And if, if you were to form a complaint about me, it would go to the integrity circle and they would evaluate it. And they would determine whether there's a real problem. And they would intervene. And they have my ear. And they have my total commitment to follow their advice. If they say I need therapy because I'm in shadow and I'm projecting that shadow onto you, they have the authority to hold my feet to the fire. And if I, if I don't succumb, they go to the board of directors and they fire me. It's in our bylaws. And it's consciously put there to compensate for exactly this problem. But it, it's absolutely in, in essential. We want the most awakened person in charge, at least able to have veto power to keep us from doing something stupid as an organization. So we're not willing to give that up, but we have to have some checks and balances to compensate for my shadows. And we have that well in place in this Sangha. At what point does unsettling someone and playing with the ego become dangerous? It can go wrong. Like it almost, it, it almost seems spiritual communities almost go bad as many times as they go well, it seems. How do, how do people avoid that generally? I don't think you do. I think you, uh, you need to compensate for that institutionally. The integrity circle in Integral Zen, which is some of our most senior students, their job is to protect other students from my shadows. And, and their job is also to protect me from collective shadows of the students and individual. This is a really important mechanism that we need to have real good psychotherapy and shadow work and people that are practicing at a high level of spirituality. We need that to be in place to avoid that exact scenario. And if, it, if you join an organization and you find that isn't in place, make note, take heed because it will go badly. Especially with someone who's saying they have no, I've, I've heard that from spiritual teachers as well. Mm -hmm. I have no shadows. You won't hear it from me. <laughs> what do you, if, if someone says to you, I have no shadows, do you run a mile? Should you run a mile? No, I don't run, but I challenge the shit out of them. I laugh in their face and I'll challenge them because every, as Roger Walsh said brilliantly, I don't care who you are spiritual teacher, president of the United States, everybody has shadows. Surely not the president of the United States. Surely not. That's the British coming through. <laughs> oh my God, does he have shadows. Surely not Brexit, right? So I, I think this is really an important thing to discuss. And it, it applies not just to spiritual teachers. It applies to workshop shop leaders. You know, you, you, when you're doing rebel wisdom workshops, you need to have the same kind of mechanisms in place. And if you don't, it's, you need to get some. Yeah. And I'll be happy to help you with that. We've learned, we've made lots of mistakes in coming to the place where we have. And what I always ask is not, do you have shadows? That's a given. Do you know what your shadows are? That's a more pertinent question. And if you can't answer that question and tell me what your shadows are, then I walk away. Mm. That's actually the very first. Whenever we do any collaborative project, that's the first process that we do, is going round, and we use the format, if you worked with me, you would learn. And then you would learn that I don't take advice very well. I always think I'm right. That, and that is, the, that is invariably the thing that deepens the field. And if you don't, I, I think if you don't do that, then your whatever organization or whatever collaboration you're doing is going to have unspoken stuff under the surface that's going to take you down at some point. So it feels like a process that needs to happen. I bow to that. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's, yeah. I'm happy to hear that. I suspect it as much just getting to, seeing the twinkle in your eye mm. when we talk about shadows and spirituality. Yeah, yeah. I, I think shadow work is the... What's really interesting, I think shadow work is the key work for right now, mm -hmm. but also there's a real upsurge of interest in it. 
as well. Mm -hmm. This is something that we've seen in our workshops. People are now coming with a concept of the shadow, mm -hmm. which they would probably not have had mm -hmm. even quite recently, which I think partly that could be Jordan Peterson mm -hmm. popularizing the Jungian idea of the shadow, but just generally, this does feel like the time of the integration of the shadow. Yeah, he certainly uh, had an impact on that. There's no question about it, and I'm just delighted to see that. Um, shadows are something that I have been studying for quite a while. In fact, a lot of my students affectionately call me, and some not so affectionately, the Shadow Roshi. <laughs> and I, I, I'm not sure if it's because I do so much work with shadows or I have so many shadows. Maybe a combination. Uh, we'll have to ask them. Could you give a concrete example of, we, th this is something that we're often, people often ask us, how do you work on the shadow? We talk about the shadow a lot. Can you give a practical example of how to work on the shadow? Yes. So one of the surefire ways, and I've heard you talk about this, especially when you were talking about the interview and people's comments when you two were talking <laughs> if something bothers you about somebody like let's take Trump for example Trump bothers me because he's so arrogant and he's so contracted and unwilling he just attacks when anybody criticizes he attacks them now, if that bothers me and you see my energy coming up, my emotion, which is I'm acting right now because it really doesn't bother me because I've seen that shadow in myself. I'm manufacturing that emotion for effect. So some people will probably say that's inauthentic and it'll bother them. And what does that tell us about that? <laughs> that they're inauthentic. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But if it bothered me that Trump was attacking every time he was criticized, then that would be an automatic indication that I'm being defensive, and that's exactly what I do. And that would be an example of me projecting my shadow onto him. Now, he has a hook that my projection will fall on because he is like that. He's extremely attacking ruthlessly attacking when anybody criticizes him. He's hypersensitive to it. So there's a hook this big to hang my projection on him. But if I look at him and I just see it's factual, you know, he's just like that, and I can't believe that he's president of the United States, and I really see the harm that that causes everywhere I look. But it doesn't bother me with that level of personalized emotion. Now it bothers me because I'm an American and it's embarrassing, you know, for the rest of the world. But I mean, that's just showing the American shadow. You Brits surely can see that pretty clearly. Trump is a great example because on yes. some level he is holding a projection. And also the sense is, for me at least, that he is the perfect trigger for the liberal projections the liberal shadow. But my concern is that at the moment, the necessary self-examination that Trump has won the election, the liberal worldview has been decisively rejected or rejected in the, in the election by a lot of people who don't share it. The, the there is not a, there's not a lot of self-reflection going on from what I see in liberal America. There's none. They are in shadow and they need to do some shadow work. You know, the, the book that Wilbur wrote on Trump really articulates that clearly. It just nails that. The, the fact that the liberals can't see how much Trump bothers them is even scarier than Trump to me. The fact that that whole thing is in shadow and disowned makes them more dangerous than Trump. More dangerous only because they're more evolved and what they're in shadow with is hidden. They're much more skillful at hiding their shadow than Trump is. He can't hide his shadow. It's blatantly obvious. 
which makes it less dangerous to me. So what is the shadow that's hidden in that context? Arrogance. Liberal arrogance. Liberal arrogance and passive aggressive violence that's been repressed. It's, it's, it's so likely to explode out. I mean, we, we, last interview we talked about culture wars. That's two shadows conflicting, right? If, if you and I were in that position where we polarized to the point that the liberals and conservatives had, then we would be that far from coming to blows. This is going to explode in a very ugly way. I don't see anything to make it better. I don't see anything happening to stop the deadlock. And that's frightening. That's really frightening. I think I agree because the idea of a, even a mediator between the two sides just no. seems like a non-starter at the moment. No. Like I don't see, that was going to be one of my questions, mm -hmm. is there a way for America to pull out of the sort of spiral of polarization that it's in at the moment? I don't see it, short of a disaster. So what do you see? <laughs> You've asked me that question before. You can ask it again. <laughs> I see disaster. That's what I see. And I don't see a specific disaster. I don't prophesize anything. But I see the only thing that's going to shock us out of this culture war that we're in is something so severe that it creates a problem that's bigger than the one we're projecting on each other. That's the only thing that, I mean, we're gonna have to have a bigger enemy than each other to unite us into a new war against a common enemy. That's how nature solves such problems. It's called war. And if you look at the world situation, the center cannot hold that William Butler Yeats poem, The Second Coming. The best lack all conviction, and the worst are full of passionate intensity. That's what I see happening. What's going to happen? Don't know. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> but I really see where polarization leads us. I see where it led us in the 30s into the Second World War. So, Shane, thank you again. Yes. It's always a pleasure, David. I, I want to just really appreciate what you're doing, and particularly because you're tackling the rough problems and questions that nobody else wants to tackle. And the, the brave effort that you're putting into this and putting it all out there on the line. Booyah. Booyah. That's a Zen thing, isn't it? Well, it's an integral Zen thing. Great. One of my brilliant students brought that in. Isn't it great? Don't, doesn't it feel good? Booyah. It's like blowing shit up. <laughs> Doshin, thank you. Deepest gratitude. Thank you. Anytime. I'm so delighted that shadow work is becoming popular because it's absolutely essential. Mm. Our survival may depend upon this work. Mm.